also want to sort of give a bit of an introduction to this morning's sermon before we jump into it because uh, it may be a bit different than normal and might require some explanation. There's a couple principles that I, I bore in mind when I, when I thought about what we might consider this morning. The first principle was that the assembly, which is what I would think we are in now, the assembly is a time for believers to address, encourage, and strengthen one another. Uh, we noted this in a, in a recent Bible study that we had on Wednesday night, that, this, that the assembly is a time for primarily for us to address one another and encourage one another, rather than visitors who, who might be unbelieving, who might happen to be present in our services. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, Paul points this out because um, he tells them that their ability to speak in tongues, which would have been very impressive, but would have been unintelligible, sounded like gibberish to most people there, that that ability to speak in tongues was a sign for unbelievers. However, their ability to prophesy, which would have been a spirit-led message or perhaps a spirit-led interpretation of Scripture for the people who were present, that that would be for the believers in the assembly. And because of that, because speaking in tongues was a sign for unbelievers, but prophecy was a sign for believers, he told them he would rather speak five intelligible words in the assembly rather than 10,000 words in tongues because it wouldn't help the believers who were present. And so we learn from this when we come together that we're here to worship God, but we're also here to build up one another as fellow believers. Um, as a preacher, I think I needed to be reminded of this because I think it can be easy to get together on Sunday morning but to preach a sermon at the world about the things that the world is getting wrong. And maybe all of the believers who are present will enjoy hearing about it and will heartily agree with it. But they themselves might not be challenged. And when this happens, maybe our Bible studies and our sermons can become what some have called creed rehearsal ceremonies where we talk about how everyone else gets things wrong, but not us. Um, I don't want to fall into that trap. I want to proclaim a message that will edify us, precisely because it addresses us in the ways that we need to grow. The second principle, uh, there's only two, the second principle is that a preacher is a herald for the king. Uh, the word preacher means herald also, like one who would deliver a message on behalf of a king, and it's really the king's message. I had, I had these principles in mind, and I was laying in bed recently asking myself what I should preach on. And I want to be honest with you, it's always bugged me a little bit when speakers get up in front of an audience and say, as I was thinking about what I should preach on today, I thought about blah, blah, blah. Um, it's okay that they do that, but for one thing, to me, it seems unprofessional uh, to waste words telling us about how you had to prepare for the lesson. You know, we know that you had to prepare, so tell us what it is we're going to be considering. Uh, it also bothers me sometimes because I don't think a sermon should be about some guy asking himself what he thinks he should preach on. Uh, it should be instead about what God wants the people to know. And we've said it before, a preacher is a herald for the king, and a herald doesn't get to wake up each day and ask himself what he wants to proclaim today. The king decides that for him in advance. His job is to deliver that message that the king wants delivered. I suppose that can be difficult because preachers are flawed human beings um, but we want to try to do that to talk on behalf of the king so conclusion a sort of combination of that is that a preacher needs to tell the believers present in the assembly what the king wants them to know and with this in mind I found myself asking God what is it that he wants us to know this morning um, that could be a dangerous question couldn't it after all when Jesus walked on the earth and he went about as a herald of truth he said a lot of things that were, frankly, very shocking and upsetting, in addition to being very challenging and stepping on people's toes. Uh, and we've been studying on Sunday mornings of Jesus' interactions with the Pharisees and noticing that often it was the religious insiders. It was literally the people in the assembly, in the assembly as the Jews would have used that word, um, for the Pharisees. They were the ones who often received the most harsh and difficult words from Jesus. Jesus was unafraid to be confrontational or corrective or to have inconvenient words spoken to people. I just wonder if he were here this morning in the flesh to preach to us, how gladly I would, I would get down out of this pulpit. Um, I just want to know what he would say. If he were here, would he offend us? 
Or would he challenge us so deeply that we became uncomfortable? Would we leave the auditorium in tears? Or also, would we leave knowing how deeply the Father loves us? Does that mean that if this morning we truly did hear a message that God wants us to know, that many of us would leave feeling offended, or that we would leave with our spirits lifted to new heights that we hadn't felt before? So I do fear that I'm deficient to the task of delivering such a message. Um, I don't have the power of delivery that Jesus would have. I'm probably not bold enough to speak words with the the same shock value with which he spoke. I definitely don't have the depth of compassion from which he would make an appeal or the wisdom to know how God's principles always apply to us. Uh, Neither do I have the ability to see and judge hearts. But I did start, and this is just an explanation for the sermon that follows, I did start preparation for the sermon by praying to God that he help me understand what it is he wants us to know. And just asking that uh, without any without any prior motives or topics in mind to do a certain kind of topical sermon. One thing that really stood out to me, a sort of principle that runs through everything that follows, is one that I've heard before presented as arm's length Christianity. One of the most powerful sermons I ever heard was by a man who preached on arm's length Christianity, and he traced cultural changes over the centuries or over the decades and showed how gradually society would go this way or that way on different moral stances and would challenge the church not to just always hold ourselves one arm's length better than the world. That instead of being so focused on Christ, we want to get as close to him, that we would feel good enough about ourselves because we were a little bit better than whatever the culture was at that time. And I wonder if Christ could be here in the flesh if some of his, his calling us out on things would be to point out how we're following after our culture and we're, we're just being a product of the culture around us. And yes, we might be a little bit better. You know, We might hold ourselves an arm's length away, but that we've been so influenced by the world around us. And 1 Peter 2, 9 through 12, we're told, You are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession so that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. So there's this huge distinction like night and day between those who are God's special people and the world. He says, For you were once not a people, but now you're the people of God. You had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Beloved, I urge you as aliens and strangers to abstain from fleshly lusts which wage war against the soul. Keep your behavior excellent among the Gentiles, so that in the thing in which they slander you as evildoers, they may, because of your good deeds, as they observe them, glorify God in the day of visitation. So I've been thinking about what in Scripture does God want us to know to help us avoid just being a product of the culture around us. I I didn't try to filter it through I don't want to offend people. But neither did I think of specific people and think, what does that person need to hear? And I want you to know that, that I wasn't thinking of anyone in particular, and really I've been thinking about more of the church as I know it in general. But I haven't been worrying too much about whether it would offend someone or not. Maybe we follow the world in terms of personal fulfillment. seems the goal of the world these days is to be happy to follow your dream, to fulfill your identity, to do whatever you want to do to make yourself happy, to to have personal fulfillment and to go on that quest. In the Beatitudes, Jesus says, blessed are all of these different kinds of people. And the word blessed is often also translated happy. And the idea is being blissful in the way that that, that God, uh, that a divine being, you could say in the more general Greek context, would be blissful or happy. But nowhere in the list does he say, happy are those who pursue happiness, or happy are those who hunger and thirst after happiness, who, who embrace their own identity, or who do everything that they want to do, or happy are those who have the money to acquire the things that they want to have. Instead, he suggests that happiness and this blessedness, this, this peaceful, restful, blissful state, comes from 
pursuing other things and from following God. For instance, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. But have we come in so many areas of our life to make the primary consideration what would make me happy? What would I like? What would carry me down the path of life in the direction that I want to go and that I have planned? So that's a lot of introduction, but now the things that follow are going to be areas in which the church may need to combat this idea of making it about personal fulfillment and following the world in that way. There's going to be several. The first one is marriage. Do we make our marriages about personal fulfillment and about whether it makes me happy or not, or whether you know you find someone who completes you? There's three purposes for marriage that I found in Scripture. The first one is in Malachi 2.15. Did he not make them one with a portion of the Spirit in their union? And what was the one God seeking? Godly offspring. So guard yourselves in your spirit and let none of you be faithless to the wife of your youth. So he, he tells them one thing God is seeking in marriage is godly offspring. That's one of the purposes that's given. Another is in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, and here's verses 1 through 5 and then verse 8 and 9, a reason for marriage that we hardly ever discuss, really. It says, Now concerning the things about which you wrote, it is good for a man not to touch a woman, but because of immoralities, each man is to have his own wife, and each woman is to have her own husband. So it's, he, he seems to be saying, look, you'll be tempted to do sexual sin, but in marriage, you'll have an appropriate outlet. It says the husband must fulfill his duty to his wife, and likewise also the wife to her husband. The wife does not have authority over her own body, but the husband does. And likewise also, the husband does not have authority over his own body, but the wife does. Stop depriving one another. That's not a sermon you hear preached very often. Maybe because it doesn't really mesh with our cultural idea that I as an individual should be able to do what makes me happy. So he says, stop depriving one another except by agreement for a time, so that you may devote yourselves to prayer and come together again so that Satan will not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. But I say to the unmarried and to widows that it is good for them if they remain even as I, but if they do not have self-control, let them marry, for it is better to marry than to burn with passion. It seems one scriptural consideration or reason for entering into marriage is I don't have self-control. How many times do you hear that asked as a as a reason for why someone might decide whether they want to be married or not. Uh, but it's one of the few reasons in Scripture that we find for marriage. One of them not being, does it make you happy? The third reason that I find is here in Ephesians 5, uh, 21 through 27, and then verse 32. Be subject to one another in the fear of Christ. Wives, be subject to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ also is the head of the church, he himself being the savior of the body. But as the church is subject to Christ, so also wives ought to be to their husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for her, so that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, that he might present to himself the church in all her glory, having no spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she would be holy and blameless. You can see already from his instructions about marriage that it isn't about what makes you happy because Jesus Christ didn't come here to be made happy by us, to just get the things that he wanted. He came here as a sacrifice on our behalf. And the church, in return, doesn't come to Jesus and then say, well, let's just do all the things that make us happy. Instead, we look to what he has, has given us to do. But then he says, this mystery is great but I am speaking with reference to Christ and the church. That third biblical reason for marriage would be to model Christ and the church to the world. So none of those reasons, as I've stated, was to make you happy, but they are important reasons for marriage, to have godly offspring, to have a, an outlet to avoid sexual sin, and to model Christ and his church to the world. Could it be that in the church... 
our mindset is changing to be more worldly in our view towards marriage, that we're viewing it more as a means of personal fulfillment. Along similar lines, in dating and relationships, is the church following the basic pattern of the world, but maybe holding ourselves just a little bit different. There's no verses here because so much about dating and relationships is determined by what we know about marriage, which we've just read about. I can tell you from personal experience that I and so many of my peers who have recently been and who are now in a time of dating uh, and engagement and entering into marriage, that we don't know how we're supposed to feel about it and nobody's telling us and we've suffered. We haven't had any guidance about this. Maybe part of our confusion is that being countercultural to the degree that the Bible would have us to be countercultural is difficult. And so we try to go halfway um, in, in areas of dating and relationships. If one of the reasons for marriage is that you don't have self control, then maybe we should consider more seriously whether young people have the self control to be alone together. But all of the Christian young people I've known have been allowed to be alone together with someone they were dating, and no one even asked them whether they had a problem with self-control or not. Something to consider. Something else that's definitely related would be our view towards children. Psalm 127.3 says, Behold, children are a gift of the Lord. The fruit of the womb is a reward. You know, Back when God first created man and woman, he told them to be fruitful, fill the earth, multiply. And now we're told that children are a gift from the Lord, and we're told that God is seeking godly offspring through marriage. And all of those things were not taught to make having children a question that's determined by a quest for personal fulfillment. The, the question is not, will having children make me happy? Uh, will, will having children help me fulfill the identity that I want to craft for myself. It seems that birth control has shifted the views of our society. Our society wants to completely separate sexual activity and childbearing. But God has put them together. Perhaps there's a reason for that. Um, I just wonder if in the church we're sort of following the world in terms of making the choice of when to have children and how many children to have and how we view them based on just what we want and maybe our careers and our our other goals and aspirations and the vacations we want to take and all those things by the way all these things that i've said my best way of knowing that it's something where the church might be following the world is that it's something where my mind has been altered by the world um, the best window i have into how we are holding ourselves just one one arm's leap from the world is when I look into myself. So I'm definitely preaching to myself on all of these. Another way where we may be influenced subtly by the world is what I'm calling scientism or maybe materialism. Most people in our world have a, a view of reality in which the material is the most real thing. And maybe the spiritual world, maybe it exists, but what's material is what's really real. Um, and the whole universe and the world is viewed as a machine that just works like, you know, cogs turning. Everything is automatic. But scripture says he causes his son to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. You know, we've noticed the pattern of the sun, how it, it comes and goes every day. And we've determined that that's because the earth is rotating and it's going around the sun. But just because we understand why it is from a scientific perspective that we see the sun rise and set, it doesn't mean that God isn't doing it. The reason why it's so constant is because God is so constant in making it that way. God is sustaining everything that happens. But I don't think we tend to view the world that way. We tend to view it as just this big machine, you know, like God wound up the clock and walked away. But describing the patterns that things tend to follow is not the same as describing why they happen or even how they're happening. It doesn't eliminate God from the picture. You know, you see a lot of times in, in atheist versus Christian debates, the atheist will accuse the Christian of believing in a God of the gaps. The God of the gaps idea is that we try to prove that God exists 
by showing how something couldn't happen without God. So we'll say, well, look how complex our eyes are. You know, our eyeballs are so complex they couldn't have it just evolved randomly. We have to have God to do it. What the scientist will say is that as more science progresses and progresses, those gaps for God get smaller and smaller. And they'll say that we're eliminating those gaps altogether and we won't need God anymore. They're missing something. They're missing the fact that we need God to exist. We need God for anything to exist. In James 1.17 we read, Every good thing given and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there's no variation or shifting shadow. Now sometimes we, we ask, why do we pray for people that are sick if God doesn't do miracles anymore? Um, maybe people say God doesn't do miracles anymore because the miraculous gifts of the Holy Spirit that were given as signs to the early church have ceased. But everything God does is a miracle. I mean, everything comes from his hand, every good thing given. If we pray that we'll arrive at our destination safely, and we drive there and, and we arrive there safely, that's a good thing that was given by God. There's a quote that I think sort of sums up the trap that we can fall into in our thinking. It says, modern science is based on the principle. Give us one free miracle and we'll explain the rest. The one free miracle is the appearance of all the mass and energy in the universe and all the laws that govern it in a single instant from nothing. That's basically what modern scientists say. We don't need God except everything just popped into existence suddenly and follows a bunch of complex laws. Now, I know we don't believe that because we do believe in God, but maybe we just feel distant from him because we don't realize that everything that happens is a manifestation of his wisdom and his glory, that all good things come from him. One last area I want to share. I know this one is something that I need to hear. Are we following the world when it comes to entertainment? Are we holding ourselves just one arm's length better than what the world accepts in terms of entertainment? Ephesians 4.29 says, Let no unwholesome word proceed from your mouth, but only such a word as is good for edification, according to the need of a moment, that it will give grace to those who hear. We may not speak unwholesome words, but do we listen to others speak unwholesome words and laugh about it? Ephesians 5 4 says, Nor should there be obscenity, foolish talk, or crude joking, which are out of character, but rather thanksgiving. How many examples of, of modern entertainment can you find without any of that in it? And Colossians 3 8 says, Now you must put aside all such things as these anger, rage, malice, slander, and filthy language from your mouth. Or Colossians 4 6, Let your speech always be gracious, seasoned with salt so that you may know how to answer everyone. We may strive to do these things in our life, but do we find entertainment and watching others go against all of these principles? Ephesians 4, eight says, Finally, brethren, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is of good repute, if there is any excellence and if anything worthy of praise, dwell on these things. I would just ask us, is the entertainment that we consume helping us to dwell on those things? I think for me, though, what, what has brought home the fact that I need to change in the way I consume entertainment is by realizing that we are to be a temple of the Holy Spirit. Romans 8, 9 says, You, however, are not controlled by the flesh, but by the Spirit. If the Spirit of God lives in you, and if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he does not belong to Christ. So if you're here this morning and you belong to Christ, the Spirit of God lives in you. 1 Corinthians 6.19 says, Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and that you are not your own? I've asked myself before many times when I'm watching a movie or a TV show, would I be comfortable watching this if Jesus was sitting on the couch next to me right now? Often, even normally, with the things I've been watching, the answer has been no. I would be worried, you know, is one of them going to say something that's inappropriate? Um, is something going to show up on the screen that I wouldn't want Jesus to be there next to me? It just gives you more perspective. But if we wouldn't watch it with Jesus sitting next to us, why would we watch it with the Holy Spirit in us? If you look at more of the context of Ephesians 4, let no unwholesome word proceed from your mouth 
but only such a word as is good for the edification according to the need of the moment, so that it will give grace to those who hear. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away with you, away from you along with all malice. I just don't want to grieve the Holy Spirit by watching things that I wouldn't want to watch with God there. Those are the things that came to my mind. I kind of just have a summary here. Things that I think maybe God would want his church to know in our day. He'd want us not to follow the world in these things. He'd want us to know that life is not about our personal fulfillment, that neither are our marriages, that our marriages are about raising godly offspring, avoiding physical temptation, and modeling Christ and the church to the world. The husbands and wives have a right to each other's bodies. The dating is not about personal fulfillment or fun either. The young people need guidance or they will fall. That what we know about marriage should dictate what we know about dating. That having children is not about personal fulfillment either. And our selfishness must not be a determining factor in when we have them or how many we have. That the very existence of the world is a miracle and all good things come straight from God. That we're always close to God because everything that exists is sustained by him. And that we ought not to consume entertainment that we would not want to consume with Jesus beside us. A lot of that, I suppose, is it's definitely countercultural to the world outside, but maybe it's close to home for us too, as much as we're a product of our culture, and I know I'm a, a product of, of mine more than, more than the Bible would have me to be, but I do want to also end on a positive note. I don't know if Jesus were here. It would be amazing to hear a personalized message for us, and I don't know how much of it he would spend calling us out or challenging us deeply but it it seems from what we know about Jesus that we would also know that he loved us deeply in Ephesians 2 4 through 7 it says God being rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us even when we were dead in our transgressions made us alive together with Christ by grace you've been saved And raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So that in the ages to come he might show the surpassing riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. You know, there's a a lot of, of, of challenging things in scripture. And it can be discouraging to have all the challenges piled on us. Sometimes when scripture steps on our toes, sometimes it steps on my toes so much I feel beaten down. I feel so inadequate. It's almost like the Judas thing. I don't want to be hopeless. I want to be like Peter and be grieved, but then rise up with the strength that God can give. And so the message of love has to be so important also. The sermon that that we heard recently was about how Jesus went to the cross, even while everyone around him was failing him and was full of flaws, and he died on the cross and said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And he offers the forgiveness to all of us that is is limitless. So I would encourage us all to you know to have to have God be our Father in such a way that He calls us to grow, but that we always know His love for us as well. If we can help you in any way uh, to respond to this message or to the gospel as you've learned it from Scripture, then please come forward as we stand and sing together.